Happy New Year, friends and allies. I got this Christmas present from my aunt. It's a party cannon for indoor slash outdoor use. Well, we're between some amount of doors. I think you're supposed to twist it. So let's celebrate New Year together for the Queen. This is my... This is my duvet. To celebrate New Year's the old-fashioned way. I recently had a Twitter poll of which of three videos I should make this December, and in addition to it being decided that I shouldn't talk about Lisa again, it was decided that I should make a glorious return to my staple of explaining how and why Bethesda are a garbage company that is bad. Um, so uh, this is going to be kind of a long thing because the problem with Bethesda is actually a problem that's inherent to a lot of the problems with companies nowadays and their business practices. And in a way, I'm talking about a much wider problem. So this is going to be a bit of a f fucking slog. You know, I've gone with the Jimquisition technique of trying to, like, write well and put kind of not all that relevant footage underneath it because it's hard to, you know, elucidate this long-form point easily without taking years. And this is a thing that happened recently. I want to address it in a timely fashion. And also, I'm, I'm late for board games at a friend's house, so... We're gonna do it. It's gonna be like that. So strap yourselves it. Oh, I should have. I should have got a strap. I should have got like a prop strap for this. And that. One second. Ugh. Oh, that's right, fuckers. Strap yourselves in. I found a belt. It's time to get sanctimonious about the future of the games industry. My stance on Bethesda games is already well known, but Mr. Softworks, if that is his real name, well actually I guess it's Xenomax, recently managed to sink to a level beyond simply remaking the previous Elder Scrolls game but worse each time culminating in straight up putting out the last game with better water textures and somehow more bugs? All that stuff was obviously bad, you don't need anyone to point that out. So when the multiplayer beta of Doom didn't do so well and they decided not to send out review copies ahead of time, citing that the multiplayer component of the latest in the famously multiplayer component having Doom franchise was so important that they wanted critics to experience it in its actual release environment, I was hardly surprised. It was very clear that it was just a flimsy justification for trying to ensure people buy the game before critics have a chance to get a look at it and recommend otherwise. Luckily though, a miracle happened. So it turns out there's this uh, game developer called uh, id Software that have been making good games for quite a while now and actually put a lot of time and effort into making the game and, and, it, and it was good because Bethesda didn't actually make it, they just published it. Doom was a masterpiece of shooter design the likes of which has never been seen before or since, which is great! I like it when games are good personally, so did Bethesda learn that maybe they should have some faith in the developers they're paying to work on those games, or at least learn not to avoid critics? Of course not. This is Bethesda, the publisher behind Horse Armor, and the fix the purposefully broken ending that you can't come back from for 10 quid DLC. Bethesda instead announced that the financial and eventual critical success of Doom has proven that they don't need to bother with critics at all, and will in fact be doing the same for all their games in future, starting with Dishonored 2 and the £20 costing high quality water effects mod for Skyrim. Which is weird, because Dishonored 2 and Skyrim don't even have multiplayer components at all to protect the sanctity of. So, what's their new justification? Well, this time it's because they want both critics and audiences to experience the game at the same time. And this generous new practice obviously worked great for Skyrim Special Edition, which released broken to millions of unhappy players who'd bought it because there wasn't anyone to tell them it was broken and to wait. You can see the problem here. Developers might care about making a good game, but they're at the beck and call of producers, publishers, executives and shareholders who have a very specific top priority. And that means making a game as quickly as possible, as cheaply as possible, and selling it to as many people as possible any way they can. So when these aforementioned goals start leading to worse games that are basically broken and worse for the consumer, and critics threaten to reduce sales by telling people this, well, it's simple, isn't it? Cut the critics out. Make it hard for anyone to possibly criticise your game before the bulk of sales can happen. Send out review copies with no time to review them. Bethesda isn't the first company to start doing stuff like this, and they won't be the last. 
Others, unhappy with simply shielding themselves from the effects of the criticism they might get, go one further and astroturf positive word of mouth, maybe pay a couple of YouTubers to release positive videos of all the unscripted, totally not carefully cut together fun they had with the game, and put a line of text in the description mentioning it's a commercial. Oh god, I set the whole cave on fire! I knew I should've got cave insurance. Hey guys, look at all this fun I was paid to have in a game that I'm selling. Game critics were allowed to be in the loop when they were being psychopathically positive about Bethesda's games. They couldn't get enough of critics back then, even releasing a Game of the Year edition, an open declaration about an award literally given to the game by critics. Incidentally, Game of the Year edition stopped meaning anything too once publishers realised there's no legal reason not to just put out an edition with Game of the Year written on it. But when critics finally started becoming, like, really, like, decent at their jobs, and realised that Fallout 4 had released literally broken on day one, and started telling people that, well, all of a sudden it's very important that everyone plays our games at once and doesn't have a chance of warning people that the games are bad and broken. Of course, immediately after announcing that they wouldn't be doing early review copies, they happily sent some early copies of Skyrim to popular and relatively uncritical YouTubers who would be happy to put up playthroughs that amount to long-form uncritical commercials for the game. Hey, it's me, GV, and wow, am I excited to bring you guys this. So Bethesda got in contact with me, yes, the Bethesda, and said that since I had been such a great supporter of all of their series, they decided to send me Skyrim the special edition early, about a month early, honestly. Bethesda have kindly sent me Skyrim early, so I can show you guys early Skyrim gameplay. Hmm, a month before release, let me check, is that, is that the same as a day before release? Hold on, let me do the ma- No, no, no it's not. This is the only kind of criticism, the only kind of conversation that Bethesda wants being had about their games, and they're going out of their way to try and ensure that. These people seem lovely, and they just seem like actually really big fans of Bethesda and their games and the Elder Scrolls series, and that's that's fine. You know, you're allowed to like bad games, that's okay. But isn't the purposeful choice by Bethesda to only send early copies out to these people really telling about the kind of audience they want to cultivate? About the level of uncritical love for a company you need to have to be permitted to play their games in advance and talk about them? Now, it would be easy to just say this thing is bad and a shitty business practice, because of course it is, but it's worse in the context of all the other ways this same problem is manifesting in the games industry. For example, there's the aforementioned fiasco where positive press was given to a game with only a whisper of admission that the content was in fact literally a fucking commercial. On top of that, there's the fact that Steam, being a platform that makes money through game sales, has thrown open the doors to selling unfinished games in early access with no guarantee of completion or of ever even being worked on, along with often actually copyright infringing nightmare factories posing as actually completed games on their platform and doing very little to combat the flood of games onto the store, oversaturating the market and leaving a lot of poor indie developers to die in the choking smog of DLC, bad games and asset flips. Steam have very little inclination to do anything about this because their purpose is to sell you games and make money from doing it. Why take anything off their shelves? Just don't buy it or make sure you play it for under two hours. So what we're seeing is actually a very consistent pattern. Business decisions that are bad for consumers and games and the overall health of the entire marketplace, but which work out just fine for the bottom line of the people running the company making the decisions in question. Which is the worst kind of problem, because it means the people causing it have no reason to fix it, or in the case of Bethesda's stance on critics, are causing it on purpose. And this affects the quality of games and gaming culture in a very direct way. Good criticism is the soul of media. What scares me about these business practices is that they cut out not only the presence of criticism in the process at all, but also effectively the need for the game to even be good. I want there to be another game like Doom, another revolutionary thing that pushes the envelope, and what chance does that have of happening if the big developers can get away with selling you any old crap or a re-release of the crap from 2011 because there was a fancy pre-order bonus? Game publishing is far from the pure, happy-go-lucky relationship I expected as a wee bairn, where a developer works on something, helped by a publisher that wants quality and makes sure it's good and sells it to an audience that finds themselves satisfied, and the company could possibly rise to the top based on praise from a healthy, critical environment. It's more like an active war between the company's ultimate goal of profit margins and everyone else, the people who want to not get a shitty broken game, the people who want to warn them about it, and the people who actually want to do a good job and make games for a living. You see stories about Crytek not even bothering to pay its employees when the company isn't making enough money. 
even though we can all be sure the people who made that decision and their shareholders won't see any kind of pay cut at all, treating their employees like, well, expendable playthings for whom decency is optional. The CEO of ZeniMax doubtless wishes his company's games were good and on some level cares about making a quality product. I'm sure he does, that would certainly help. But the bottom line clearly matters more than that, doesn't it? A spreadsheet said there would be more money if the critical establishment was circumvented, people were kept ignorant and were viral marketed to by the less critically discerning people they're subscribed to on YouTube. And so that was the decision that was made. It becomes frighteningly clear that companies acting in their own best interest is almost inherently bad for everyone involved. But you didn't click on a video about video games to get a lecture about the inherent structural antagonisms of free market liberal capitalist economics, did you? All this talk of problems and complaining. Where's talk of the solutions, you whiny twerp? I hear you ask. Well, firstly, thanks for trusting me personally with coming up with how to save the games industry. I appreciate the support. And secondly, one thing I'm definitely sure isn't the solution is simply talking about how bad this stuff is whenever it does happen. You know? Just talking about it doesn't really help. And neither does this attitude I've seen quite often on YouTube where people will talk about the bad thing that's happened and then be like, hey companies, Start treating us better, out of the goodness of your hearts. Publishers, stop pushing out incomplete games. Be brave and push back the release date if you have to. Give us games that are complete, that are in full working order and that aren't missing any features. If I'm giving you 40 of my hard earned pounds, that's not too much to ask in return. Yeah, just tell them to be brave, that'll fix it. Again. You already bought the game, and all you did was expect better from a company that already has your money! I'm giving you 40 of my hard-earned pounds. Do you think developers are really gonna start delaying games in order to release a finished product when the business model works? So, what's the alternative? Now, I could just say buyer beware, scream caveat emptor, and run off into my survival shelter filled with backup Bitcoin wallets and posters of Ayn Rand, Rand Paul, Paul Ryan, Ryan Rand, Nand Paul Rindin, and Skeletor, but short of giving you directions to your local library where you can find a copy of the Grundrisse, the unfortunate thing is there isn't any other option than to become better consumers. We have to become more savvy than ever, not just for the short-term benefit of not playing bad games, but the long-term one of protecting the industry from profiting from business practices that will lead to good games being less likely to actually happen. So with that in mind, I've thought of a list of some concrete, useful advice for progress. This isn't some, oh, here's a couple of vague suggestions, maybe ask them nicely to stop being bad nonsense. This is... Harris Bomber Guy's Comprehensive Manifesto for Saving Games and Thoroughly Decriming the Industry as a Whole 2017. 1. Do not buy games from publishers who support bad business practices. Straight up, if a company no longer cares about the critical process or about being good, you should no longer care about paying them for it. This means you might not get to play Fallout 4, remastered with slightly prettier water edition that I guarantee you is in the works right now. Or you might not get Watch Dogs 3's protagonist's iconic Frozen-themed Poundland tat when you pre-order. Oh, fuck's sake! But by buying into it, you're literally supporting them doing that. Don't let it continue to be profitable to do it. Please, you will thank me for this. Just don't. If you do, you are helping make gaming worse and should probably be arrested. This issue is very slightly complicated by the fact that, yeah, Doom turned out to be good, and as you can see from this footage, I clearly did buy Doom. But I bought it in a sale, uh, and if Doom were to be released now after all of this, I probably wouldn't ever. Because this isn't- this shit's fucking important, guys. To support independent developers. It's very, very easy to pretend video games are a meritocracy where good video games rise to the top and make a lot of money inherently. But considering factors I already talked about, like the oversaturation of Steam with fucking garbage and DLC and free to play and garbage and garbage, word of mouth is more important than ever in promoting games that don't have a massive marketing budget or established franchise they know you'll already know about. My top 11, well 12, video has been out for only a couple of days and I've already had comments from people who really like the games I recommended but had barely heard of them, if at all, before. And in my opinion that's proof that word of mouth isn't doing its job, but that doesn't mean it can't. This will help support creators who definitely need it more than mega corporations and function as a reminder that if your game is actually good, there are very useful benefits to that. Maybe, paradoxically, 
be a bit frivolous and overly encouraging towards indie stuff. Buy weird little games on a whim that seem good, but maybe not quite your thing just to see. Indie games are often cheap and very often on sales. It's worthwhile to expand your horizons and good to ensure the perpetuation of little guys who might just need a little more support to keep going and make something truly great. Do you think a fresh startup could have made the new Doom? No, it had to be id. One of the most veteran companies in games, supported monetarily by Zenimax's Bethesda, one of the richest companies in games. Yes, that means you're partially supporting games for reasons other than quality, but games are not a meritocracy. And if we don't put our fingers on the scale, we'll get fingered by the people with scales. Yes, I did just imply the CEOs of game publishers are lizard people. Please don't unpack that right now. I'm, I'm on a roll here. Three, support critics. For games to be good, there has to be an active conversation about what makes games good. And we have to propagate the idea that it's okay for there to be curators who play games so you don't have to. There are a ton of critics out there and some of them will line up enough with your tastes that their recommendations will be useful or their ideas will at least be of interest and worth hearing about to inform your own perspective. There are tons of great critics of both games and the industry out there. I personally really like Noah Gervais, Shay May, Mr. B Tongue, Joseph Anderson, ActionButton.net and Waypoint in case you've missed out on them, but there's also Jim Sterling and Giant Bomb who everyone hopefully knows at this point. It's worth noting that Giant Bomb literally started because Jeff Gerstmann was fired from GameSpot for writing a negative review of a game by a company paying to advertise the game all over the fucking website and they threatened to pull them. A new critical revolution in gaming is has started and is going to continue. It's just a question of how to get these ideas applied in development itself. You might be wondering where the money to do the last two things is going to come from, supporting all these people. Well, that's solved by the first thing. With all the money you now have from not pre-ordering bullshit you didn't need or buying games that perpetuate bullshit. Save that money in your mattress for when you need a dentist, but maybe invest some of it in protecting your favourite industry. And of course, number four, partake in criticism yourself. I've heard a lot of people snarkily say, oh, everyone's a critic, but everyone literally is a critic. That, that's my entire point here. It's good to be a discerning customer, and it's good for you and games to find ways to articulate why you like them. The more intelligent the consumer base, the better games have to be, because shit like this won't fly anymore. It's good for people to be informed and smart about their choices, and that means thinking about this stuff for yourself. I constantly get curious cats and AskFMs and tweets and comments asking about the specifics of design ideas I've presented and calling me out on aspects I might be wrong about. And this is good. It's not a competition with the goal to be the smartest. It's a conversation with the goal to help come up with a useful perspective together. You see all these people who just hit dislike and ran away? You see all these flippant comments that provide nothing? Do you think these people are going to be considerate about the effects of continuing to pre-order garbage? No! If more of us are less like this, because we think about this stuff and try and communicate about it with each other effectively, everything can and will get better. So to sum up, basically, don't support developers who do bad business practices, who do bad stuff, just don't. Emailing them's not gonna work. Asking them nicely is not gonna work. Yelling sanctimoniously at them's not gonna work. Don't buy the games. Don't pre-order games ever, ever, for any reason. Find critics who either line up with your views so you know you can trust them, or whose views are interesting enough that you can gain some useful perspective and support the shit out of them. Think a lot about games. Think too much about games. Start reading books with charts and graphs in them and worrying if you might be thinking a bit too much about games, but then push past that and realise that it doesn't matter if you're becoming a bit pretentious, because pretentiousness is just kenning to a higher thing that you might not reach, but you might reach it. Have a nice time thinking about stuff. Maybe share your ideas with the rest of the world, maybe become a major critic yourself, or uh, at least engage critically with things because that makes you a smarter person and a better consumer. Don't worry about thinking too much about something that you care about. Maybe try and get Tim to let you write for actionbutton.net and get turned down. You know, whatever, that's fine. Uh, and, and maybe meet another games journalist and, and fall in love. You know, and if you get all these ducks in a row, maybe you won't be alone when society collapses because you'll have love and doom to play when she realizes that you like the Star Wars prequels. I'm gonna I'm gonna put on some coffee. <laughs>
Thank you all very much for watching, and thank you very much to everyone who's supporting me. That's what all the names are that are going past the screen right now. But in addition to those names, I'd especially like to thank... Cut to the recording I did earlier. A mysterious benefactor, Alex Lemkovich, Alexander Corbett, Alicia Parker Martell, Amy Lech, Anna S, Aquila, Ash Stryker, Ben Adamson, Bill Mock, Billy Layden, Brennan Arts, Cubert, Caden Patine, Caleb McMurphy, Casey Schneibel, Kieran, Corwin Light Williams, Damian Edney, Daniel Vincent Chilton, David DeMazalu, David Kenner, David Rose, David, comma, the Benevolent Malevolence, Desmond R, Emily O, Eric Hunter, Eugene Butler, Evan Ritchie, Felix Meyer, Femininja, Findlay Bowick Copley, Fruit, Gabrielle de Belfwiel Jurajuria, Gary Marshall, George Alder, Grafen Blackpore, Haruspicus SA, Hero Rewar, Jack Harvey, Jan Anders, Jason Rounds, Jason Walter, Jay Logan, Jeff Ladd, Jeffrey Theobald, Jerry Terry, John Cantwell, Jordan Tullis, Joseph Greco, Julius Nyborg Ollison, Cavzile, Cav P, Kevin M. Knippi, Christina Downs, Lady Naga, Layden Pierce, Luke Gould, MK, Mackenzie Cockerill, Magnus Ardney, Malarkey Bingo, Marco Shade, Mike Stanley, Mr. Clonum, Mr. Xenophobe, Mans Silver Platz Thunstrom, Neverminder, Niels Abildgard, Olivia Mello, Owen Piper, Philip Huber, Pontus Firm, Rebecca Washam, Recovering Zombie, Renee S, Rickard Hevosmar, Richie Mainville, Robert Phillips, Samael, Sammy J, Scott Girton, Sean Kemp, Siegfried Pinzer, Silas Pumpkins, Spilt Coffee, Stephanie Aldrich, Thad Wazalewski, Thomas Kistner, Jenny Angel, Tom Martell, Zachariah Taylor, Zachary Clark, J.H., Lizzie Roberts, Parker Anderson, Rakami, and Instant Grant.